Hello and welcome to Crux Investor. We caught up earlier today with Brandon Monroe, CEO of Bannerman Resources, a ASX Uranium Junior. They've just raised some money. We ask why, how much, and what they're, what they're going to be doing with it. If you want our thoughts and opinions on that conversation, you can find that at cruxinvestor.com forward slash club, or in fact, as part of our weekly show, we're going to be digging into the weeds a little bit with him. Uh, you can also find on there detailed company reports and analysis as commentary from experts from around the world on a variety of companies and commodities. There are training videos on there to help you with your diligence process. We've got summaries of all the interviews that we've done just to save you some time. And of course, our big thriving community of intelligent uh, investors sharing their thoughts and ideas with each other in a nice, friendly and safe environment. Sounds nice. Go and join them at cruxinvestor.com forward slash club. We'd also like your feedback. So give us a like, we appreciate it. Leave your thoughts below. We'll get back to absolutely everyone. And of course, if you want to see precisely what we talked about today, take a look in the description below. Brandon Munro, how are you, sir? I'm really well. I'm pleased to be on. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, th th thanks, thanks for coming on. Um, we noticed that you have gone and raised some money. And we were wondering why. So we wanted to have a quick chat about it. Um, now, we obviously have a weekly uh, Uranium show, which we talk about, and lots of people uh, see that in the club. Um, we're talking today about Bannerman, and I think it's a much wider audience. So you're going to have to give us that one minute overview of what Bannerman is before we get into the conference conversation proper. So if you don't mind. Delighted to. So Bannerman Resources, we're listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. We are a uranium development company focused on the Itango Uranium Project in Namibia. It's a very advanced project. We've been working on it since 2006. And through that process, we've taken it all the way through a definitive feasibility study and pilot, plody, a pilot plant study, uh, which went for three years. And that was at a very large scale, which actually produced 7.2 million pounds per annum over a significant mine life. And what's really changed in the last year is we've now put out a scoping study in August for the Itango 8 uranium project. It's a smaller, more streamlined version of a Tango, much lower hurdles develop, development, and it enables us to get into production sooner with lower development hurdles. And once we're in production and profitable, we're in a position to then consider upscaling if necessary to the original scale. Love being in Namibia. We're also listed on the OTCQX market. And, um, We've just released a announcement, as you say, that we've raised a bit of money. You have, you have. So, and a few things have happened since when we first started talking, which is that one, you've changed the the way that you're approaching this project to the market at the end of last year and the beginning of this year for uranium companies. So, in terms of the equities, has seen some peaked interest from generalists. Uh, coming in funds and, and retail for that matter. Your share price has trebled in the last two months, I think, along with, as, as have a number of you, uh, uranium companies. So did that make the conversation that you were having with for this raise a bit easier? Look, no question. And I think there's two elements to what you just said. First of all, in terms of the project, what I realised when I was talking to institutions and others as part of this process, many investors thought they knew Bannerman, but what they knew was the old Bannerman, the Bannerman where we had a giant sized project, but a project with a really significant capital hurdle. In fact, it was 793 million US dollars. And for the size of the project, that was pretty fair. The problem for many investors was that was overwhelming compared to our previous market capitalization, particularly during the bear market phase. Now with the Tango 8, apart from the economics generally being improved, the CapEx in particular has come down from that 793 million to 254 million. So that's had a big impact on NPV, had a big impact on IRR, and it's really transformed the nature of an investment in Bannerman Resources. So I found that although that news was put out into the market in August, Back then, there still wasn't very much interest in uranium stocks. And because of the idea that many investors had that, oh, yeah, Bannerman, yeah, we, they've been around for a long time. We know them. They did really well during the last boom. We don't need any more information about them. Through this process and through this engagement, we were really, really able to get the word out about just how much more attractive we are as a result of that. And as you say, the market really has had a substantive sentiment switch 
really in the last two months. And that's been driven predominantly by investment out of North America, particularly the North American names, the Canadian and the US names. And we've uh, been fortunate to achieve a re-rating during that process. And because we are the first of the Australian uranium companies that have raised since that re-rating took place, we've been a bit of a litmus test as to the extent to which Australian institutions have also enjoyed that same uh, switch in terms of their approach to uranium, their belief in uranium and the sentiment. Well, let's get into the terms of, of what it is that you've actually done. You, you've raised 12 million Aussie dollars. Um, talk us through the terms, and then I'd really like to sort of dig into you know, how those conversations went. So we raised 12 million. That was the issue of less than 115 million shares, which ends up being a bit under 10% of our capital structure. So by no means a heavily dilutive raise. We raised at 10.5 cents. And to give you, that was a, a discount to the current trading price as it needs to be in Australian market. But to give you an idea of why I think shareholders are very pleased with that, over the last 12 months, our total volume weighted average price is less than six cents. So we have been able to lock in, I think, benefits for existing shareholders as a result of this re-rating. The response that we had was really overwhelming. It was tremendous. And of course, every company wants to say that they were oversubscribed. We were heavily oversubscribed, and I really mean that. So we started with a cornerstone investor, Trebecca Investment Partners. They're a specialist uranium fund out of Sydney, Australia, an existing shareholder, and they wanted to make sure that they had a substantial part of this raise, which meant that we, we didn't have an enormous amount left to raise and that ended up being oversubscribed by several times. And because of that, we could see this, uh, this book getting out of control. And so we closed it after only a few hours. Okay. So let's, let's get into this because when I hear the word discount, I'm a bit nervous. But then you and I have in the Crocs Investor Club section talked about discounting um, and what it means and how you should interpret it. So why, why 12.5%? In the Australian market, it's quite unusual to have uh, a discount of less than, say, 12 10%. And often that might happen because a company's coming off um, recent highs. And so really, you're looking at a discount of uh, something that's perhaps a bit uh, bigger when you compare it to more recent VWAPs. And um, so our discount, 12.5% to the most recent trading price, about 16% compared to, say, the 30-day VWAP and the 15-day VWAP. So we regarded that as being fairly customary. There's no warrants. There's no additional uh, transaction or fees other than the typical broking fees that are paid. So it's a good, clean transaction at a reasonable v uh, discount. And the thing about this uh, this market in Australia is without providing some level of discount, you, you don't really have an awful lot of choice in terms of who you can bring onto the register. There's a lot of institutions and fund managers that they take a discount for granted. And unless you are in a very hot momentum driven sector, which uranium isn't yet, uh, you just want to make sure you can pick and choose. You want to make sure you've got a wide choice of potential investors. So you can use the opportunity to really continue to improve the register. And we, we certainly had that opportunity and I'm very pleased about that. So it's amazing, you, you mentioned Tribeca, obviously well-known uh, uranium investors and, and previous shareholder or current, they were shareholder previously as well. Um, continue to be a shareholder. Continue yeah. to be a shareholder, better phrase. I'm guessing you were aiming at mostly at institutions, but what about rights issues? What about existing share, retail shareholders? How do they participate? So we did want a predominantly institutional book. We wanted the opportunity to build more institutional interest into our register for various reasons. But we also wanted some private client interest. They're important for liquidity afterwards. They're important for the aftermarket and particularly the aftermarket support with the nature of the sentiment and momentum we're starting to see in uranium. 
there wasn't the opportunity, unfortunately, to extend the offer to existing shareholders. There, there will not be a rights issue. There won't be a share purchase plan. We had the chance to do a placement on very good terms at the right time, we believe, with the prospect of some very good momentum. And those factors are unfortunately incompatible with a rights issue or a share purchase plan, which have a very long tail, tend to suppress any momentum in the company for several weeks after the raising and also um, quite significantly discourage institutions. Okay, so what were you saying to these funds, these institutions? You know, I guess I, I, I hear you when you say uh, we're retelling the story, but what were the bits that they're buying into? Because we're seeing so much movement into u- uranium from generalist funds, not just the specialist funds. So what, what are, what's the thing that they're latching onto? Yeah, so I won't give you the shopping list of what's great about Bannerman. Um, instead, I'll tell you what they latched onto, to use your words. So the first thing where I think we've established a really solid degree of respect amongst institutional investors in this market is we are very fastidious stewards of our finances. Uh, We've only raised, this is the third time in five years. Uh, In 2016, we raised at 3 cents. In 2018, we raised at 4.6 cents. And now we've raised at 10.5 cents, as I said, against a yearly VWAP of under 6 cents. So not only have we raised at the right time, but we've made that money last. So almost three years ago, we raised eight million and we still had three of that left. And in the meantime, we've done an enormous amount of project work and put out a scoping study on a very different type of project to what we had previously. And you know, a lot of these guys have seen me in the back of the plane and that type of thing. So they know how we run the company and that's something that they can respect. The other thing that I think was particularly interesting to the institutions is there aren't many companies left on ASX that haven't already had their run at a raising. In fact, we were the last substantive uranium company to raise. Everyone else raised during the year. So there was an element of this is a fairly unusual opportunity to get set in a very good quality uranium name in anticipation of what's widely regarded as being the eve of a very, very good period of time in uranium. So we had that advantage, uh, both in terms of a well-known name and well-regarded, and also for particularly for institutions who prepared to come, prefer to come in in primary raises rather than buying on market. This gave them the chance to get a good foothold that they can then enhance if they wish to in the market. And look, I think the third and probably the most important thing that relates to what I was just saying, Bannerman still has extraordinary leverage to the uranium price. And we retain that because we've essentially got two very distinct bites at the uranium market cherry. The first one is a Tango 8, and that's designed to be a 3.5 million pounds per annum project over 14 years with the potential to not only extend the mine life, but also uh, once we've been in production and been profitable for a few years, we could choose to increase our production rate and build, for example, a second plant. It's all designed so that that um, is possible and will be feasible of the way that we see the market improving. But by the time we're ready to finance that, if the uranium market has developed in the way that many of our investors feel that it will, and we've got a upper uranium price scenario, then we can still build the giant sized Tango project. It's got a definitive feasibility study. It's got all of the backing of a pilot plant and that produces 7.2 million pounds per annum over a significant mine life. So that coupled with a very large resource of 271 million pounds, all in the one project, gives us that leverage. And what they now see is that with this being a substantive raising that enables us to get all the way through to that financing decision uh, with uh, either of those projects as we choose, the antithesis to leverage, which is dilution, is no longer a feature for us until we're ready to raise equity to finance the project, if that's the way that we proceed. It's, it's interesting to me that the market is 
looking at uranium again. The institutions are looking at uranium again. You're, you're one of the um, nearer term producers, if I, if I can put it like that. There's a lot of, a lot of big exploration stories out there, which are finding it e equally comfortable to get financing for. Um, was, was that part of the discussion? Was it, was it just a case of anything uranium or the fact that you're a near term producer was, was again part of what got you over the line? Yeah, that, that's important, particularly for some of these institutions that have got uh, medium to longer term timeframes. Uh, and a number of institutions who, quite frankly, we were surprised they were prepared to invest in a company our size. We're still only 150 million Australian dollar market cap, but they're obviously taking a longer term view and they're investing in not what we are now, but what they think we'll become. So for people who don't know the story, we're currently in the process of completing a pre-feasibility study for a Tango 8, and we expect to be able to commence a definitive feasibility study by mid-year. What's unusual for us is that all of that work has been done at a, at a definitive level, but for a much bigger project. So it's quite a streamlined feasibility process. When you add up some time for financing, and a construction, which we expect to be 18 to 24 months, it, we would anticipate that all going smoothly, we'd be in production in 2025. We already have our environmental permitting, so that's not a potential roadblock here. Uh, everyone knows that uranium is very well supported in Namibia by both the government and the host community, so that's not a roadblock. And the project economics are robust, so there's a, a real level of belief by uranium believers in our capacity to get into production within that time frame, And as you say, Matt, there just aren't that many projects who can confidently say that they can do that. But part of what I think many in the uranium sector are starting to appreciate is that whilst there's an existing supply deficit in this sector, and it's substantial, by 2025, it really becomes crucial in the context that there's very few mines that can come on in that time frame to actually deliver into that supply deficit. And by 2028, it's forecast to gap out to a, to a critical level. And what's nice about our Tango 8 project is we can be in production to meet the financial benefits for shareholders of that 2025 level of deficit. But if we see 2028 develop in the way that we expect and hope, then uh, we can just double production or increase production even further to achieve some very substantial super profits that this cycle is expected to deliver for uranium producers. Fantastic. Talk to me about the amount. You've chosen 12 million bucks, and I hear that you were over oversubscribed. You know, a lot of people want in on this story, and I'm, I'm not surprised. But why 12? Why not 8? Why not 16? How did you come up with that number? It, we wanted to keep the... Um, effect on our register to under 10%. We wanted to be in the category of a sensible raise. I understand that shareholders don't die like dilution. I mean, I'm a large shareholder in the company and uh, because of regulatory reasons, I can't participate in this without a, a whole lot of hassle. So I wanted to avoid dilution. The, the, ref, the board holds 11% of the company and they wanted to avoid dilution. Um, but we would say this is very constructive dilution. And keeping it under 10% means it's very reasonable. And as I said before, we've only raised three times in the last five years. And what we found during the last raising was we raised well, we got the timing right, we used it as an opportunity to improve our register very substantially, and that has set the company up really incredibly well. And we raised eight million at the time. And there might have been a couple of eyebrows back then saying, well, do you really need that much? What's it done? And I've got to tell you, it has placed us in a totally different league to most of our peers because we've had that balance sheet security. We've got no debt, we've got no convertibles. And so it's a nice clean balance sheet. So by raising 12, what we've been able to do is ensure that that balance sheet security, that risk mitigation, that distinguishing aspect of our uh, risk profile as an investment continues on going forward. And because of the technical work that's already been done on at Tango, we don't expect the DFS to be expensive. And that gets us all the way through to, as I say, uh, achieving a financing for this project. 
The message, of course, that that sends is as this uranium sector continues to pick up and as things inevitably go a little warmer and get hot in this sector and FOMO and all of those sort of things kick in, there is only one way into this stock. We, we won't have investors sitting on the sidelines saying, ah, oh, you know, these guys, they raise all the time. I'll just cuddle up to the brokers and make sure I'm on the list. There is only one way into this project until we know how we're going about financing a Tango 8. Okay, so you got, you'll have, after this, pro forma balance sheet, about 14 million bucks, gets you through to investment decision, but you're not going to be tearing through that cash, it sounds like, either it's just giving yourself a little bit of comfort room too. Yeah, uh, absolutely. There's nothing that's going to change in our corporate culture just because we've got a healthy balance sheet. Um, we, it's absolutely burnt on our foreheads here that we deeply respect shareholder funds. And I, I even needed to concede a, a bottle of wine to a broker for a couple of things that he did during this process. And I assured him it's coming out of my cellar, not going on to the, the company account. And that is literally how we do things around here. So um, that will last us a long time. And as I say, it gives us security and over time, it'll start to differentiate us further from our peers as well. Okay, well, like, um, thank you very much for the update. I just wanted to, because like I say, you're one of the last ones to raise. I wondered if you were going to, or wonder if you could um, get, get through without it. Um, timing, impeccable. Well done. Stay in touch, let us know how you get on, okay? Yeah, great. Thanks for having me on, Matt.